Can you hear me? So do I... Excellent. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Natale. I'm a scientist. I'm the Arctic Program Director at Woodville Climate Research Center. And this next session is going to focus on wildfire and permafrost in northern regions. Um, we had some sessions about wildfire yesterday. And what's, uh, what I wanna, we want to highlight in this session is that the interaction between wildfire and permafrost thaw. So I'm going to start with a quick overview of the processes and what's happening now in the Arctic. The next speaker will be talking about um, projections of future change incorporating wildfire and permafrost thaw. And then we're going to have another panel. We had just an excellent panel. I hope you are all here for it. We have another panel that will um, feature um, Arctic residents to talk about the changes that they're seeing on the ground. Okay, so wildfire in the Arctic and uh, boreal regions have been happening for a long time as part of the sort of natural uh, ecosystem processes. This isn't a problem when we think about greenhouse gas emissions um, or hasn't been because regeneration is happening fast enough to sort of make up for the carbon that's lost during emission. But recently, um, the fire intensity and severity have been increasing across the Arctic, similar to other parts of the planet. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, one of the big reasons why wildfires are increasing in the Arctic um, is because the winters have been warmer, the growing seasons have been longer. Uh, 2020 was a record fire year in Siberia. 2021 broke that record. Um, the winter before 2020 was quite warm. The growing season started earlier. It was quite dry. Um, there were temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit above the Arctic Circle. Um, the other thing that's happening in these northern regions is that lightning is increasing. And so, um, you know, lightning was very infrequent, if occurring at all, in, in the tundra. And anecdotally, um, more and more you talk to Arctic residents and they talk about seeing lightning. I had never seen lightning in tundra until last, a couple years ago. And now lightning training is part of our field safety when we take scientists out to the tundra. And that was something that was never part of, of, of what we were thinking about. Um, and then lightning strikes are also expected to continue to increase two to three fold. And the reason for that is because of climate changes, changes in atmosphere conditions. Um, I, I want to show this. This is a map of global fuel consumption. And I think, you know, when we think of wildfire, at least in the U.S., we think a lot about what's happening in the western United States. Um, but if you look at this map, the dark, the orange and the and the red areas are areas of high fuel consumption. And you see these places in the northern latitudes are some of the highest fuel consumption um, in the world. Um, and so as fires increase, carbon emissions are also increasing. And, and one of the big reasons why there's such high fuel consumption in the northern regions is because, as you've been hear, hearing in these previous sessions, all of the carbon that's stored below ground. So when fires burn in the Arctic, they burn the vegetation like everywhere else, but it also burns below ground because there's massive stores of carbon. Whoops. Okay, so this is just some trends of uh, carbon emissions from Canada and Alaska. We see have been increasing fires over the past several decades and projected to continue uh, into the future. And then here are some fire emissions from Saka Republic. And this is where I want to point out, um, you know, if you look in this last bar, this is 2021 and it's almost off the charts. Um, if we think about what's been happening, that, that dash line is the emissions from the fires in all of the Western United States. So this is really quite substantial in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of black carbon, in terms of smoke impacts, um, and all the other impacts that are happening on the ground, which you'll hear about um, in the, the panel at the end of the session. Um, so this is another view. This is um, northeastern Russia and fires. You can see the dark here. The dark red areas are fires that are happened in the past five years. We see this increase in fires in the recent years, but also fires are moving north. So we're seeing more fires in tundra regions and areas where there are very deep peat deposits. 
But the other reason I, thing I want to point out here is that the blue shading here is all areas where there's permafrost. So perennially frozen ground. And we're starting to have fires increasing on areas where there's permafrost. And that's a problem because when the fire burns off the vegetation and it burns off the organic matter, um, that vegetation or the organic matter is really good insulation for permafrost. So when you remove that in the summertime, it's essentially like opening the top of a cooler. So all of a sudden now this permafrost is much more vulnerable than it was before the fire. So you get this carbon in pulse with the fire, but now you're also making these systems vulnerable over very long time frames. Um, so this is what it looks like when fire burns in a permafrost area. You can see um, this is an area with these areas uh, that are light brown, that's kind of uh, sphagnum moss patches, and the fire is burned off all the vegetation and down into the soil. Um, as I said, the impacts of fire can last for decades or more. Um, ground thaw increases anywhere between 15 and 35 percent, up to a decade or more following fire. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about, which has gotten quite a lot of headlines, is zombie fires. Um, zombie fires aren't something that's new, but they are happening more frequently, and they got a cool name, so now everybody's talking about them. But essentially, a zombie fire is just a fire that overwinters from one year to the next. And the reason this can happen is because the fires are burning below ground, because there's so much carbon. And so here's um, some satellite imagery. This is a fire from 2015. Um, in Alaska, and you can see this is the outline of the burn scar from September. Um, and then here we see that burn scar in April. Oops, sorry about that. And then this is a new fire that ignited in May. And and people who live in Alaska know, like know this is a, or, sorry, live in the Arctic, know this is a thing that's been happening. You can see where there was a fire the year before, and then you go in the spring and you start seeing the smoke again. Um, the reason that these are increasing is they're related to the they're related to climate and they're particularly related to the previous year's climate. And so increased fires cause increased fires. So there's a positive feedback. When you have more fires, you have more of these zombie or overwintering fires. So you can see that in this figure here. So the um, the orange line is the previous summer's temperature. Um, the gray bar is the annual burned area. So this is from the previous year. And then the red bars are the number of fires that overwintered. So we see in years where there was a lot of fires the previous year, uh, and also there was a very warm previous year, this then leads to increased overwintering fires. But the other thing that's important about these overwintering or zombie fires is that they also burn deeper. So we've had, and, and one of the things that's happening in the Arctic is soils that used to freeze through the winter are now staying thawed throughout the winter. This is the other reason why allowing these overwintering fires to increase. And so they're causing more fires and then also causing fires to burn at a deeper level of thaw. Um, okay, so just to, just to keep in mind, um, the next speaker is going to be talking about the global implications, and then we're going to talk about the regional and local implications. But I just want to point out, globally, um, there's a lot of carbon that's stored below ground. The fires are burning off this carbon. You know, 1.3 to 1.6 trillion tons of carbon stored in the northern permafrost region, twice as much as in the atmosphere and three times as much as in every tree and every forest on the planet. So this is a large pool of carbon that's becoming more vulnerable, and it's becoming more vulnerable both because of thaw and because of fire. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind is yes, this last um, IPCC report, so AR6, did incorporate um, in the carbon budgets permafrost feedback. It did not incorporate wildfire impacts on permafrost thaw. It did not incorporate burning below ground from wildfires. So there's carbon emissions from the Arctic that are happening that currently still are not incorporated when we're thinking about how much carbon will be released as a result of climate change in northern regions. Um, okay, so what does this mean in terms of how much carbon will be released? Um, the estimates of carbon emissions are, there's still a lot of uncertainty, but I just want to point out, and partly because we're not accounting for fire, and our next speaker will talk about this some more, but by the end of the century, they may be on par with, with Russia, with India, or with the United States. So these are some of the largest global gas emi emitting countries um, and not fully accounted for in an appropriate way. Okay, so permafrost and Arctic wildfire emissions that will use up a substantial proportion of our carbon budgets. We'll hear just how much in our uh, upcoming talks. 
um, yet they're not fully accounted for. Placing the global temperature targets at risk. There's no way we're going to make 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius for many reasons, but we're never going to make it if we don't do the accounting properly. Um, and I just want to touch on some of the local impacts, and our speakers will be able to hit this much better than I am because I am not an Arctic resident. Um, but we know there's concerns from wildfire because of black carbon deposition, which can land on ice and snow, uh, leading to additional melt and, and regional feedbacks. Um, of course, impacts of smoke inhalation and human health. Um, you know, um, aviation in northern regions, uh, flying is how most places are accessed, and this is a big problem in terms of bringing in food and other resources. Uh, tourism and recreation, natural resources, infrastructure, cultural resources, water quality, erosion, direct deaths, injuries, military installation. So there's a number of local and regional impacts that are really important, important economically, important culturally, and important for human lives and well-being. And with that, I'm going to um, uh, two web pages if you want to find out more information. And I'm going to pass this off to the next speaker, which is Rachel Traharn. And she will be talking about sort of future impacts of wildfires and permafrost thaw and carbon emissions. Thank you. Hi, and thank you so much, uh, Sue, for that fantastic overview of fires and, and their role across the Arctic. And um, thanks, all of you, of course, for being here. Um, you've almost made it through the first week of COP, so um, that is fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Um, and so, oh, I broke it. Um, but so, um, so really, as, as Sue said, I'm a researcher at Woodwell Climate Research Center. I'm interested in permafrost thaw and fire. And I'm going to pick up um, really quite directly from um, some of the points that Sue made about the impacts of fire um, um, in the in the Arctic. And you've heard about some of the those local and regional impacts, um, which of course are really quite a broad range. So impacting everything really from food security to um, the, the, impacts of smoke, the impacts of smoke on human health. Um, and we're going to delve into those and what it's like to really experience those, the panel discussion in a moment. And um, But we also know that on top of these really critically important local and regional impacts, what happens in the Arctic, and that includes the impact of fires that happen in the Arctic, really doesn't stay in the Arctic. This is something that also affects all of us around the world. And as Sue um, mentioned, this is really because the Arctic is an enormous carbon store. So this map here that you're looking at, this is just showing the extent of permafrost, so that frozen ground um, across the Arctic in blue there. And this region, the permafrost region, it really only covers um, something like 22%, so less than a quarter um, of the land surface. But in this um, quite comparatively quite small region, this stores almost twice as much carbon as there is in the entire atmosphere today. So that's more than twice as much carbon as there is in all of the trees on the face of the planet. And for a little bit of context, if we saw just 10% of this carbon that's stored in the Arctic permafrost being released into the atmosphere, then we're looking at an increase in atmospheric CO2 concentrations of something like 75 parts per million. So this is, um, it's really a pretty significant change. And of course, one of the threats um, to the, uh, the carbon that's stored in the permafrost in the Arctic is fire, um, as, as we've talked about. So again, as Sue uh, mentioned a little bit, when the Arctic burns or northern ecosystems burn, a lot of the emissions that happen during the fire are actually coming from below the ground rather um, from the burning of the vegetation itself. So we have these really deep, rich, carbon-rich soils in the Arctic, and often those fires are smoldering away in the ground um, and releasing carbon that way. And on top of that, there is this very close relationship between fire and permafrost thaw. And I think you can really quite intuitively see one of the main reasons that this is the case from this photo. So when we have these fires happen, of course, um, you're losing the vegetation. And as well as that, you're really darkening the surface of the ground. So you've got this very dark, um, heat absorbing surface. So really this is raising the temperature of the ground. It means that these areas are absorbing more heat down towards the permafrost. Um, and of course this means that um, as the ground takes up that more heat, um, we're looking at either an, an initiation or an acceleration of both gradual permafrost thaw 
and these more abrupt permafrost thaw processes. So just um, for a little bit more clarity on that distinction, when we talk about gradual thaw, this is actually often what we're talking about when you hear scientists or, or others talking um, about permafrost thaw, we're actually talking about gradual permafrost thaw. So this is um, referring to this kind of process where we see a gradual warming from the top of the ground, um, basically a grading down the surface of the permafrost. So it's this kind of centimeter by centimeter, year by year process. I mean, this is the, um, it's the dominant uh, sort of source of, of permafrost thaw, but it is not the only one. So we also see um, what I'm calling here abrupt thaw. Abrupt thaw is actually kind of an umbrella term for a lot of different processes. Um, if you were able to catch um, Jens's talk earlier about, about deep carbon in permafrost and, and some of the ways that that is made vulnerable, these are the kind of processes we're talking about here. So slumps and um, kind of large scale uh, landscape changes that you often see in pictures um, like this one. And this is a process that um, it happens, perhaps affects a smaller area, but it can affect several meters of carbon really quite rapidly. So this is, these are processes that can be taking place um, on the time scale of, of uh, years or, or even days, as opposed to that kind of gradual, consistent, um, slower process of gradual thaw. So we've talked about these processes, we've talked about carbon release from fires and its effects on permafrost thaw. And then the question quite clearly for permafrost scientists and for fire scientists is how much carbon will be released from this um, from this store in the Arctic. And I'm gonna do um, the classic sort of researcher move here of um, talking about why this question is so hard to answer rather than trying to directly go into the answer. And the first reason there is, is perhaps a little bit intuitive. So we know the Arctic, it's not just one place, it's a huge region. It's enormously variable, even over quite small spatial scales. And it's, it's fairly sparsely populated. Parts of it are quite inaccessible. And the outcome of that is that we don't have um, the data that we ideally would like. And just to kind of highlight that, this is um, the map you've seen already showing permafrost extent. But on top of that, we've plotted the locations of monitoring sites that are recording uh, carbon dioxide and methane fluxes throughout the year. And you can see there's, there's huge expanses of the Arctic here that are really just have none of that monitoring happening. So we're really, um, in at least the respect of some large parts of the Arctic, we're really flying blind, um, trying, to, try, trying to understand what, it, what is happening here. The second reason is that we're really actually only beginning to uh, try and account for some of these processes in climate models and in the policy tools that are developed from climate models. And this is something that Sue um, touched on as, as well. And this is something that we're working on um, quite a lot at Woodwell at the moment. So at the moment, the situation is that a very small minority of climate models include anything to do with permafrost carbon at all. I think it's something, something like four uh, models that are out there that, that attempt to, to look at permafrost carbon. And no climate models at all currently include these other processes. So none of those are including the release of carbon from below the ground as a result of fires across the Arctic. None of them are including those are more abrupt permafrost thaw processes. And none of them are including the interaction between those two things, which um, of course we know is something really important and that will become more important as we see those fire regimes continue to intensify across the Arctic boreal zone. And so this is something, um, as I mentioned, that we're working on at the moment. Um, and one of the ways that we're doing that is um, some work that I'm doing. And this is taking a kind of a reduced complexity Earth system model. So essentially a simplified climate model. And we're having a kind of first stab at putting some of those processes into this model, um, sort of in, in the face of those challenges related to data and things like that, that I've mentioned, or mentioned already. And so this is, this is work in progress. This is not something that we've got to the stage of publication or peer review. But of course, I did want to um, try and give you a bit of a flavor of, of what those um, outcomes might look like. And so what you're looking at here is uh, one example of a sort of possible future of emissions from gradual permafrost thaw. And this is under a pretty moderate warming scenario. We're looking at um, RCP 4.5. And this is um, emissions from about the present day out to the end of this century. And in contrast, if we kind of use this updated climate model we have to rerun this scenario 
and look at the emissions that we expect to see from those other processes we talked about. So from fire, from fire mediated thaw and abrupt thaw. Um, this is what that looks like. So you can see that this is um, really something that is on the same scale by itself as gradual thaw, which is the process that we tend to, um, to tend to focus on. And even when we look at a, a much more extreme warming scenario, so RCP 8.5, when we know we expect to see much more widespread gradual thaw, even then we see that these underrepresented processes, which again are not included in any climate models, um, are really of a similar scale. And for a little bit more context here, um, this is the uh, emissions from the EU in 2017. Um, and these are the emissions from the, the from the US um, in 2017. So really what this is kind of suggesting is that if we continue to leave these processes out of climate models, we continue to leave them out of our carbon budgets and therefore out of these policy debates, what we're essentially doing is ignoring the contribution of something equivalent to a major economy by the end of this century. So what do we do with this information? Of course, we're all here at COP. Um, and the obvious message really is just to kind of increase that urgency of mitigation. Um, we all know that the window of opportunity to reach the Paris Agreement goals, to reach those goals of one and a half and two degrees is, is closing. And really what this suggests is that that window is potentially closing even faster than we think. And I think what we all need to keep in mind is that these numbers that we talk about are carbon budgets, the future warming we expect in response to different in response to different scenarios. These things are, are not safety nets. Uh, we know that there are processes out there that are not included in those things, and we know, and we've seen here that at least some of those are substantial sources of emissions. Um, and so, with that, um, I think uh, we will be moving on to our panel. Um, and I'd like to, as we sort of prepare that give a quick plug if you're interested in these issues, of course, um, ask questions and stick around and talk to us. And also on the front desk, we've got um, a lot more information um, and some briefings and also some little QR codes, which will take you to a platform where you can look at some of this data and play around with it um, and find out a lot more um, background about these issues. Thank you. And I think we'll move on to our panel. They uh, will introduce themselves in a moment, but we are really lucky to be joined uh, by Darcy Peter, my colleague from, from Woodwell, and uh, by Jill McClark from Vivo Barefoot, um, and also, also by Sam, who's also going to be telling us about um, some of the impacts um, that we're seeing from these processes on the ground. And this panel is going to be uh, moderated by Sue Natali. Thank you. All right, uh, drink Wednesday, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Darcy Peter, and uh, I'll be moderating right now. And uh, I just want to open the floor to Doma Sam, uh, and Sue already introduced herself. So if you two want to introduce yourself, that'd be awesome. Uh, my name is Sam Schimmel. I'm Kenite Indian and Siberian Yupik from Gamble, Alaska. 
Uh, my community is one that sits at the uh, in the middle of the Bering Sea in its northern region. And uh, I come from a subsistence community where all of our food comes from our ocean. It comes from our land and it comes from the resources that are around us. So I'm really happy to be here with you all today and excited to see what comes out of this panel. Um, hi, um, I'm also do the, can do the greetings in my uh, uh, indigenous language, Sambana. I'm, um, um, I'm coming from Siberia, from Lake Baikal. It's not that north or not part of the Arctic region, but um, my community is already suffering from what you've seen so far, and I'm, I'm here to share the story. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Darcy Peter. For those of you who weren't here at uh, the last panel, um, I am Koyakon and Gwich'in Athabaskan from the remote village of Beaver, Alaska in the U.S. Uh, it's located about four miles below the Arctic Circle. Um, there are 30 people who reside there year-round, and we also practice a subsistent way of life, uh, hunting, fishing, and trapping, and everything that we collect is used and put into our freezers. Um, yeah, so thank you all for being here, and um, thank you, Sue, for your talk. It was awesome. Um, I think I want to kind of shift gears here and ask uh, Sam and Dolma um, what some of the climate changes you've seen in your communities uh, and how that impacts your cultural way of life. And uh, since I come from a community also, I'll uh, answer after you guys do. Well, thank you, Darcy. Um, I, I don't know where, where all of you here come from, but I, I would venture that each of you lives in a place where there's a, a grocery store that whatever's on your table at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day is something that you purchased, that you bought. It's not something that was caught or that you had to go catch or somebody that you know had to go catch. Um, for our subsistence communities in Alaska and around the world, it's a very different reality. Uh, our food that we eat on a daily basis is not something that we buy from a store. Uh, it's something that we go out and we harvest and we catch. This means that our diet of marine mammals Things like whales, seal, walrus is critical for our communities. In our communities, we don't have grocery stores. Uh, we have incredibly high rates of unemployment and things that you can buy from our village stores, which are very understocked, are incredibly expensive. Things like a gallon of milk might cost you $12 there, where it may only cost a dollar or two dollars here. And so we rely very heavily on our subsistence animals and subsistence foods to survive. Now, with climate change, we're watching those subsistence stocks change. We're seeing our animals come later in the year and leave earlier. We're seeing the reality that where I'm from in the Bering Straits, we're no longer having sea ice in the wintertime. Uh, sea ice is one of the critical things for walrus to be able, able to calve. When walrus give birth, they can't do it in the water. They have to do it on ice. They don't like going on the land either. They have to do it on the ice. And what's happening is as that ice is moving further and further north, those walrus aren't able to stay in those places because the water is too deep for them to dive down and catch their own food. And so when it comes to climate-related impacts to subsistence, we're watching as our subsistence resources that we've relied on since time immemorial are being diminished and they're slowly and in some cases very quickly moving out of our reach. And so this means that there is immediate food security needs that are being laid to bear by climate change. It means that there's immediate nutritional needs as a result of these animals being malnourished that are present. It means that there is a plethora of issues that are coming about as a result of climate change. So that, that's, that's one of the main impacts that we're seeing from, from my community. Thank you. Um, I come from a really small community from Lake Baikal. We've been the uh, first indigenous people that uh, um, 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 basically settled there. Originally, we came from a uh, Mongolian side of the, um, of the border and uh, yeah, 800 years ago we got settled. And um, yeah, my family, I, w I was born and raised in a tiny community of like 200 people doing uh, subsistence farming all day long and uh, herding, herding the animals and uh, basically watering the plants all entire my childhood. And I haven't been, since I moved uh, uh, to uh, Britain as a human rights lawyer and uh, social business uh, um, sort of entrepreneur, I suppose. Uh, I haven't been home for a, for a while. So I took my kids for the first time in five years this summer. We arrived in August and we end up in um, basically 
almost like in a quarantine. When we arrived and uh, we landed, I saw what looked like looked like a, a fog, and was so dense, and I couldn't work out. Like, and normally we don't get this kind of fo fogs like that. I'm thinking, wow, like what the <laughs> what's going on? And then they opened the door. It's actually smoke, smoke that came from the north. Even if the epicenter of the fire was like probably 2,000 kilometers away, imagine how shocking it is when you land. You get that. I was reading about it on the news, etc., but I kind of never really um, thought it's gonna like you're gonna land in the middle of an environmental emergency. So then, uh, for 10 days, we stayed at home, couldn't get anywhere, and um, it's quite obviously it's devastating. This is my family lives there, and then for many many generations. Um, Everything was super predictive, like everything is super seasonal. Everybody knows when when do we need to plant uh, um, uh, the plants and when do we need to harvest, etc. Like all this knowledge has been passed on through many generations. It was like so organic. And now we get uh, the lightning, which we never did the, really, really had before. Like in, um, it's very dangerous. Like nobody actually trained. Nobody knows how, like, you know, when you're going to be hit or whatever. So I think there's a whole lot, uh, like, awareness that needs to happen. Uh, the second thing is around the uh, flash flooding. Uh, we also never had that, like, at this uh, scale. And then uh, obviously temperatures are changing. It's uh, extremely scary and worrying that the uh, um, our brothers and sisters and tribes living more towards the north. They uh, obviously we never had like plus 38 degrees ever before, and uh, uh, yeah, it's quite scary what's um, happening, and it's all touching us on daily basis um, today. So yeah, um, and then I was uh, privileged to work with the uh, indigenous communities in different parts of the world, but the most relevant one for today is uh, the Sami community, and then I can share that project maybe a bit later. Yeah. So uh, um, uh, I'm here with our family company called Vivo Barefoot. We actually have a, a stand at the UNF C pavilion and we're launching this vision of regenerative footwear. So we've been working uh, on this project for the past 10 years with scientists, anthropologists, uh, with biomechanics scientists. And the, the theory is that uh, um, currently the way how we produce and consume is obviously so disconnected from how we used to do everything foot by foot um, from localized materials like thousands of years ago when everything was extremely regenerative, localized and sustainable. So we went back uh, uh, to the Sami community, to the, to the San Johansi San community in the, in the Kalahari Desert to learn how, like, what's, how we can recreate this logic and the way to manufacture and the way to produce things, but also make it uh, regenerative. So with the Sami community, they um, uh, make uh, this uh, probably the only actually like trademarked uh, um, uh, shoe footwear <laughs> that's made out of uh, uh, reindeer. And uh, it's the lightest uh, um, winter boot uh, on the planet. But then now the community is getting affected uh, on uh, obviously the movement uh, of the reindeer. And uh, we've basically seen it now firsthand and we're trying to basically collaborate not just with the Sami community, but the indigenous communities around the world, you know, like the, um, uh, the Navajo the, um, community in India, in Mongolia, in the uh, Kalahari Desert, basically to preserve the cultural uh, uh, cobbling techniques, but making sure it's done in a way that it's a uh, net positive for the localized environment, if that makes sense. So uh, the idea is that to launch a, a regeneration fund. So you all know about like uh, carbon offsetting, but the, with these uh, community programs, we can create fund for regeneration where uh, it's no longer about like offsetting or being like net neutral or net zero. Then we need, it's like we're way past beyond that. So, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I hope I didn't wobble too much, but uh, that's basically the idea. And uh, come and visit us and we can tell, tell, tell more. That's at the UNF C Pavilion um, stand called Vivo Barefoot. So, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. No. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, that's super important work. And I'm, um, yeah, thanks for being here and for sharing your experience and your work. It's really meaningful. Um, yeah, so me, uh, I kind of, I come from an, an interior Alaska perspective, um, so non coastal. Um, and the changes that we're seeing um, in terms of climate change uh, are directly tied to our culture. And you can't really have that conversation without talking about policy either in the US. Um, so 
permafrost is thawing, obviously, uh, in Alaska, and that's causing our riverbanks to erode. The Yukon River is a lifeline for many indigenous communities, if not all, um, along the Yukon River, and it provides uh, food, water, shelter, everything that our people completely rely on uh, as a means of subsistence, so survival. Um, and if the permafrost is thawing, that's changing the, um, the chemistry of the water. It's changing the spawning grounds for salmon. Uh, for me, much like uh, Sam here, it's um, climate change is creating incredible food insecurity uh, in terms of what we're able to harvest and hunt and collect and put into our freezers and live off of. There's no grocery store in Beaver. Uh, the nearest one is 110 miles away. Freight is very expensive, so we rely completely on the environment for uh, survival. And um, with the thawing permafrost and the eroding Yukon River, uh, it's changing the salmon spawning grounds, like I said, and that um, is one of the many contributing factors to the mass decline in king salmon in Alaska. Um, this past year was the first year since, um, I believe, ever that my community wasn't able to fish. We were completely shut down by um, the Alaska Board of Fish um, because there aren't enough salmon for us to fish. Meanwhile, uh, commercial fishermen in the ocean are by catching hundreds of thousands of king salmon. So uh, in terms of policy, it's very um, unjust. It's not fair at all. Uh, indigenous people are contributing the least amount to climate change and we're feeling the impacts and the regulations the most. Um, it's a huge conversation. Uh, and since we aren't able to um, fish, a lot of um, the pressure for food shifts to then moose. Um, and to harvest moose, I mean, there are uh, regulations in interior Alaska that also are unjust. Um, out of the one month that we're allotted to hunt and harvest a moose, maybe two weeks of those uh, are the moose actually viable and uh, is it easy to hunt and harvest a moose. So that's two weeks out of an entire year to get one moose. Each person's allowed one bull moose. Um, I was fortunate to get a two-year-old this year, uh, but I was with a different family of six people. There are eight people in my family, so that's a lot of people. For a two-year-old moose, it's very small. Uh, yeah, meat's going to be pretty scarce this, this winter, um, but we have meat and that's, uh, I mean, that goes straight into our freezer. Uh, the, none of it's for sport. So that's, uh, in, in my perspective, uh, a lot of it is food insecurity and clean drinking water problems that uh, are the impacts that I'm seeing in uh, Beaver, Alaska, where I'm from. Um, so we're obviously really tied and um, work really closely with cultures that uh, rely on the environment. Um, and this is uh, a pretty science heavy pavilion. Um, and I think that I want to ask each of you, all of us, um, how do you think scientists and policymakers can better engage with, interact with, and learn from Arctic indigenous residents? And how would that benefit to the value of the research and or policy? I think this is coming to me. <laughs> so I am a scientist, I'm Sue Natale, I'm, uh, and I work with Darcy at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. Um, and I'm not from the Arctic. I, I live in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, so land the Wampanoag people, and I shop at a supermarket, so I, there's a lot that I do not know. And as a Western scientist, the way that we get trained is to be very, very focused and to you know be an expert in a certain area. But we know, and then we try to um, do interdisciplinary work and sort of connect with other scientists who are really, really focused. But if you've listened to this panel and the previous panel, people who are relying on the environment and living in the environment, they don't need to sort of take the world apart and put it back together because the world's together, right? I mean, you're talking about food security, you're talking about health, you're talking about, you know, how you, how you move around the landscape, um, you know, what the habitats are for animals. And so, I guess the best way, I think the question was how the best way to learn. I think the best way to learn is to listen. Um, and yeah, like I have to set, tell that message to myself a lot, like just shut up and listen because I learn a lot when I shut up and listen. And um, some, and also making the time to do that. I think that we often are very, have this urgency of having to get things done and having to get things published. And so building in that time, if that's important, which it is important because honestly in the long run, we will get much farther, much more efficiently if we take the time to sit and listen from these experts um, in the way that we do the science. Um, and I and I have to say the same thing goes for policymakers. I mean, I think again, it's it should be a conversation and not just me doing my science and putting it out there and saying, here it is on a platter and it's not really useful for anyone. So I think the same thing goes for policymakers sitting and having the conversation and spending that time and having the conversation and thinking about and listening and asking what is what is the science and how is it that you want it to be 
done? Like, what what is useful? Um, you know, if that's a priority, if it's not a, you know, yeah. So I'll stop there. Pass it on. So um, I've done quite a lot of activism when I was growing up. Where, uh, at the age of 16, uh, with a crew of my university classmates, we started an NGO to clean up the shores of Lake Baikal from rubbish because there is no like social infrastructure. Like you know, government didn't put basically enough bins, and uh, there is no like system behind to keep the territory clean. However, Lake Baikal is the deepest lake in the world, contains uh, 20 plus percent of the fresh world water, is UNESCO heritage site. And then this is how it's treated. It's like, I mean, like, I mean, everybody knows that Russian government is um, <laughs> all over the place and uh, it was like, uh, yeah, a bit helpless. So with the students, we did that. And then when I moved uh, to Europe, I started raising funds and sending to Russia to support the program because it's still going on. And then they did uh, this law about uh, international agents. If you receive funding from overseas or like outside of Russia, they basically our accounts got blocked and we didn't have access to any of the finances that were raised here for like two years. So we had to do like tons of paperwork. So there's kind of like practical examples how uh, you know terrible the system is in the first place. Uh, the, the second thing is like, uh, how do you amplify the voices through whatever work you do? Like we're an example of a, uh, like you know baseline sort of footwear business but uh, you can still utilize your product as a, a medium for storytelling so as an example this year this spring we collaborated with a, a us-based ngo called oxygen it's like almost like an advocacy media ngo and we did a, a, an open letter to unesco on uh, stopping harmful algae blooms and there was also related back to lake baikal because it's all getting um, um, algae blooms and they can be also toxic depending like what what caused the blooms because like the industrial agriculture uh, the water runoffs and then it basically um, um, disbalances the system and then the water that was pristinely clean you know even like six uh, seven years ago now uh, you get like all this green uh, um, I don't even know how to describe it sorry <laughs> English is not my first language but uh, you you we used to just drink the water from the lake basically let's put it that way and now we don't do it because it's like we never know what's inside now so yeah so i guess there's um two things co-create and then um somehow make sure the government listens <laughs> but it's a uh, tough especially in my home country um hmm. I, I guess my um, thoughts on this are, are rooted in, in one of the formative experiences that I've had. Um, at the age of 16, I had the honor of sitting on our governor's climate action leadership team, which was led by the first Alaska Native lieutenant governor of our state. And in those meetings, it was uh, a team that was 26 people. Uh, one of which was a native youth, and the rest were scientists, industry leaders, oil and gas executives, forestry people, fisheries people, native communities, that were all coming together to try and formulate a comprehensive plan with regards to climate change for Alaska. And I remember very specifically a, a meeting between myself, our lieutenant governor, and the, the chairman of research for the University of Alaska. And in that meeting, the chair of research for the university was saying that we need to study the things that our native partners in this room are saying because we can't prove them right now. There isn't scientific proof of what our communities are seeing, what they're saying. And so uh, what our lieutenant governor said is our communities have been living in these places for thousands and thousands of years. Their observations in a single day measure far past what Western science can see in an entire year because it's built on our traditions, it's built on our historic knowledge, and it's built on the stories that we pass from generation to generation. Uh, long before we were seeing currents changing, or Western science was seeing currents changing in the Bering Straits, my uncles were talking about how it was different. Our tides were changing, the ways that our water came in, the nutrients that was coming up, and the way that our whales were feeding. We were seeing those change in the 1990s. You didn't hear Western science start talking about this until the mid-2000s. Our communities are 
uh, in a sense, from an observation standpoint, a canary in a coal mine. We're the first ones to see it because we're the ones that feel it. And so while we can embark on large research projects that take 10, 15 years to come up with conclusive results, our indigenous communities living in these places see these changes day to day. Uh, and so I think good policy and good research are done in, in such a way where there's collaboration and, and not consultation. I think a lot of times you hear consultation, consultation, consultation. And at the end of the day, what consultation means is that, uh, well, actually, how many of you guys are researchers here? That, that would actually probably be more, one, two, oh, actually a lot of you. And um, uh, are the others affiliated with NGOs or stuff like that? Yes. So in consultation, I think what happens or what it really means is that you can sit down with the indigenous community. We talk about what we want to talk about. You tell us what you want to tell us, and then you don't have to, you're not obligated to include anything that you've heard. You just have to listen to us say it. And this is our relationship with the federal government in the United States. We say things, they disregard it, they do what they want. Whereas collaboration means that you're working together with a community. It means that you're going to a community and, and saying, all right, what do we want to study? Because we have people come to our island oftentimes, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on studies that have very little applicability to the actual needs of a community. And so the, the scientists are alienated, the researchers are alienated from being able to gather any information from our, our people because we don't see its relevancy. Uh, and so in research, there needs to be clear and understandable communication about what is actually being researched, how that relates to a community. And, and I know that you have to submit abstracts to get funding and submit things like this, but um, trying to co-develop research goals is really critical. Um, I remember at our island, there was a, a group that was trying to study sea ice. And they spent two years observing our ocean ice, and they came to our school to, to present their findings. And um, we had our Yupik language teacher, one of our elders in the, in the school, and he saw their title slide, and he saw the first two slides, and he stood up, and he told them their conclusion before they even got through all of their research not because he'd been paying attention to their research, but because he knew our ice. And so sometimes there's simple answers to the complex questions that are being asked. Uh, and, and, and really a lot of time can be saved and a lot of direction can be saved just by asking the indigenous community, what, what are key things that we could look at? What are key things that you're observing and how can we help to prove the things that you're seeing? Uh, because when Western science and, and indigenous knowledge come together, you actually see good policy coming out of that. So th those are just my thoughts, though. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much more I can say than that. Um, yeah, I think uh, as a scientist and as an indigenous person, um, I have a really unique perspective just because I have one foot kind of on each side, um, maybe like a foot and a half on the indigenous side and half a foot on the science side. Um, yeah, I think one thing... Um, that researchers and uh, policymakers can do better echoes a lot of what Sam's already said, that you can spend time with the community. You can co-develop a project with an indigenous community that's going to be beneficial for both indigenous people and researchers. Um, I don't see the value in research for the sake of research when it comes to climate change, because what good is research if it only benefits other researchers? And it never works its way down to indigenous people who are living on the land and who are seeing these changes. Um, it's really hard to be based in Texas researching Alaska when you're based in Texas. You're really disconnected from policy, you're really disconnected from the people, you're disconnected from the land. You spend maybe two weeks out of the year there uh, versus um, working with people who've lived there since time immemorial uh, and have a plethora of knowledge to offer um, if you so choose. Uh, and if, you're, um, if that's a priority of yours, which it should be, because it can only be benefit and add to the quality of the research itself. Um, I don't think anybody would be opposed to having um, like thousands of years of research um, added. It can only add so much value to it. And that's something I think is really important. Um, I think another thing researchers can do a lot better um, besides co-producing uh, projects is they can communicate their science better. Um, it's so easy and there are requirements. I, I know that people have to fill, they have to publish or perish. Um, and 
then they consult an indigenous community. They don't, you know, work with one. They consult with one. Uh, they slap the tribe's name on the paper at the end and they send it off to the tribe in a language that's completely foreign to them. Um, there's graphs, there's tables that they don't understand. No one's communicated with them what this means for them on the ground. And they've just uh, exhausted a bunch of resources indigenous people have by sharing this very sacred knowledge um, that's been passed down from generation to generation to get a paper that's maybe 20 pages long and that they don't understand. Um, that where they saw so much hope in like, oh my gosh, like I'm gonna go into policy and I'm gonna induce change like for food insecurity or for clean drinking water or for, you know, jobs, anything that the indigenous community might need. Uh, and they saw this outlet to maybe get something done is now just a paper that they don't understand. So I think something in, uh, researchers and policymakers can do better uh, is just to communicate with indigenous communities, to have uh, a newsletter that's full of pictures that, uh, is, that exemplifies what your research means in a way that people are gonna understand. It's spending extra days in the community during the field research season there to have a community meeting, get locals in the room and listen instead of just talk and project your own project out onto people. Um, yeah, it's just listening, like Sue said. Uh, it's sharing your research in a way that people are going to understand. Uh, you can go on local radio stations uh, and be like, "Hey, this is who I am. This is how long I'm going to be here." We have a community meeting. Please, like, I have no agenda here. I'm just here to listen to you guys uh, and give you some food and snacks. Um, it's it seems so simple, but it's so uncomfortable for so many researchers to actually follow through because it's so different than what they're taught in academia. Uh, that's my experience in the U.S. and I'm not sure if uh, anybody else has anything more to add to that. Um, yeah, so we still have quite a bit of time, but I think uh, we might take some questions from the audience if anybody has any. But uh, before I do, I kind of just want to ask anybody uh, about their last remarks and um, what the key message is that you would like to give to international policymakers and people in positions of power who can implement change in Arctic indigenous ways of life. I can just do a quick remark. Um, one thing that wasn't mentioned is about uh, also empowering the um, community scientists. Like now, we're, at the end of the day, we're living in 21st century. Pretty much everyone has internet, even my parents. <laughs> my mom just signed up for Facebook like a month ago, um, but she has no idea what I do. Um, but what I'm trying to say is like, uh, I think we should uh, come up with a system, at least I, I don't really know if it works in our community, but I'm sure there's all this like next gen, uh, young kids thirsty to be, I mean, obviously they care about the community environment, they grow up in it, etc. And I think we just need to empower it and like make them the scientists. And uh, yeah, that's my two cents. Um, I think in terms of Arctic policy, I think, um, I guess for people who are decision makers, I think listening more to the voices of the folks here and recognizing, um, you know, when we think about climate loss of land as a result of climate change, the Arctic often is not a part of that conversation. Um, we think about island, island nations and that's critically important and I'm glad that those voices are starting to be heard. But um, communities in the Arctic are losing their land as a result of permafrost thaw, as a result of erosion, as a result of fires and all of these things are connected. And so I think getting this, these um, sort of slow onset events um, in northern regions into the conversation about loss and damage is, is critically important. Um, in the U.S., we, there's also right now this erosion, permafrost thaw is also there's zero climate change adaptation planning um, in our country. And so there's just sort of no, no leadership at all and no guidance at all. So I think hearing these voices, getting a better understanding of what's happening right now on the ground, I think is really important. And then I think as a scientist, um, I, yeah, I, I guess I'll say I'll stop there. I'll shut up and listen now and, and pass this on to others because I really um, am fortunate to have this opportunity to be on this stage, but also to learn from, um, you know, Darcy and I have worked together for a long time, but just to taking that time to listen and to learn and being humble and being uncomfortable at times, um, I think is really important. I think that the, what you said is really important. Ensuring that there's listening happening, ensuring that there's communication happening between indigenous communities and research. I mean, I, I understand I'm talking to uh, a majority of researchers here. And um, I think really 
what's what's critically important on the research side is that co-development is making sure that when it comes time to publish a paper, when it comes time to write a paper, when it comes time to research a topic, that topic is informed by indigenous views. I understand that sometimes this won't be the case, but in the majority of the things that you write, I ask you to reach out to the community before you submit an abstract or before you submit a proposal and you say, what these are some ideas that I have, what do you think? Foster those relationships with communities, foster those relationships with individuals so that they're in a position to be able to help direct research towards the issues that are present on the ground. Um, there's, there's a saying that's in our community, which is that indigenous peoples used to not trust researchers, uh, but now we just can't tolerate them. Um, and that, that's, that's partly because sometimes research can get a little bit esoteric. Uh, I'm sure anybody who's spent more than five hours in front of Google Scholar uh, knows that sometimes it can get a bit into the weeds. Um, and so that is important to get down to the bottom level, but it's also important to have broader applicability. So making sure that when working with indigenous communities, there's a clear applicability to that community. Um, in terms of policies, right now you're watching as carbon markets are emerging. We're seeing the commodification of carbon. Before it was um, oil, before that it was gold, now it's carbon. Uh, and in order to ensure that there's protection for indigenous peoples and our environment, um, we need to really focus on what's being talked about in Article 6. Um, that means ensuring that there's human rights protections and environmental rights protections. That means ensuring that there is full and effective participation for indigenous communities when it comes time to designate these sites. And it means making sure, and, and, and participation is not consultation again, it, it is a right of refusal on a policy. Um, and then also making sure that there's redress mechanisms in the event that such policies fail. So I, I guess in, in closing, um, I, I ask all of you to, to go about your research and to, to just ask the simple question, one of how can I help, and then two, explain how this relates to me uh, in our indigenous communities. Explain those, those relevancies and ask those questions, and I think you'll be surprised by, by your results. So thank you all for, um, for coming, and I'm gonna give it to Darcy. Yeah, so uh, before I give my short answer, um, do you want to explain what Article 6 is for people who don't know? So Article 6 is the part of the convention here that is regarding carbon markets, um, figuring out. So I'm sure all of you have heard about cap and trade or carbon markets or things like this. Essentially what it's saying is that I'm going to run my car here or my oil well here, and then in order to offset the carbon that's going to be emitted as a result of this production, I'm going to set aside this land over here. And there's concern for this for indigenous peoples and environmentalists alike uh, in the sense that land that's set aside um, to be considered a carbon reserve can be very restrictive on what happens. Uh, in the United States, we have something called the Park Service. And what they do is they set aside land and they call it a preserve. And the mandate is to preserve the land. And, and under a lot of doctrines of land management, we don't see people as part of an ecosystem. And that's, that's a fickle thing. Yes, Western civilization really isn't part of an ecosystem. Indigenous communities are. We're, we're the stewards of our environment. We're really the only ones that can call the forest our home. And we are the ones who do population management, clean up our forests, make sure that there's controlled burns in certain communities and in certain areas. And so when you pull us out of an environment, you, you can see the changes to the ecosystem. And so uh, in set-asides, we want to make sure that subsistence is able to continue. We want to make sure that our rights to our way of life are not infringed. And then in terms of development, we also want to make sure that we are equals at that table. We're able to say, no, this can't happen here. Or no, this can't happen this way. This has to happen according to these set these uh, terms that we lay out, or this happens with a profit sharing agreement, or something of that nature. Uh, so we want to make sure that these are safeguards that protect our rights and protect our lands, uh, and and really at the end of the day, uh, I think enforce uh, indigenous sovereignty, the idea that we have the power of decision over our our lands, over our ways of life, and over our peoples. And, and, and so that's really 
where those concerns come about with Article 6 and kind of how that fits into this this larger picture of, of trying to build a new world that's based in, uh, in, in clean and green energy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Ar Article 6 is a huge topic of conversation, um, or it should be here at COP. Um, so if you don't know too much about it, I'd encourage you to delve into it. Um, yeah, it's a big issue. Um, I think my takeaway message wouldn't be too um, different than everybody else's. It's, uh, yeah, do ethical research. Um, care about people before you care about research. Um, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We're not all scientists. Uh, and indigenous people are living on the land, and we have been for many generations. Um, we are very in touch with place. We know our resources and the land uh, that are on the resources, or the resources that are on the land, excuse me, insanely well. Uh, we're very in tune with what's happening. We have a lot of knowledge, um, and we're, again, the ones feeling the impacts, I'd say, the most heavily. So uh, make sure it's ethical. Make sure your research is applicable. Like Sam said, um, work with communities, not on them, not alongside them, work with them, include them in your research, give them uh, financial compensation, give them um, the credit where it's due, uh, and realize that there are different knowledge systems and different ways of knowing and different value systems that are um, just as valid as Western ones, um, if not more. So yeah, I guess that'd be my end takeaway message. I'm not sure how much time we have left, um, but we might have some time for questions but I think that's it for us in terms of questions that I have. So thank you. All of you, that's been another absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, we do have um, a little bit of time for questions, so I'll just check if we have any of those coming in online. Um, and otherwise, we definitely, I think, have some um, from the floors. So would you like to come up to the microphone and ask a question? Sure. Um, can anyone hear me? I don't know. I don't have the headphones on anymore. Um, so I think there was an announcement yesterday, and I'm probably going to get the figure wrong, but something like 1.7 billion for supporting indigenous people to get land tenure rights. And I don't know how much kind of which indigenous people that affected, but I just, yeah, super interesting talk and thank you all so much. But I wanted to know your perspective on those kind of financial big pledges and commitments versus kind of what you've talked about in terms of actually working with you know, policymakers coming to you and involving you in those discussions and kind of do you, what do you think about that financial announcement and what it will actually do for Indigenous people and how much can that solve the problem versus what you've already talked about? Yeah, so uh, I'll just say really quickly, thank you. Um, give that money to Indigenous people, period. You know, I think that when it comes to large donations, money is always a good thing. Uh, when it's spent right. Um, money, money's a good thing because it, it helps us enact uh, our policies. You know, th there's this strange idea that without resources, you can't actually be sovereign. Uh, and that's that's a reality for our sovereign communities in the U.S. Um, but in terms of, of large donations, um, they're big numbers. They're big numbers that go to big organizations that rarely end up on the ground. The best way to make investments in indigenous communities is on the ground. It's not from the top down, it's from the bottom up. We know how to manage our lands best. We know how to manage our people best, and we know how to affect change for our community in the best way. We don't need organizations like Greenpeace or anything else coming in and telling us, one, how we need to live, or two, how we should be spending resources, or three, spending resources on our behalf without our direction. Um, so large dollar pledges wonderful they do good things but that money rarely ends up on the ground with our communities and, and the better place for it is is making those direct cash infusions to communities who are struggling with needs uh and, and that's really what i what i think there um, i i'm very uh, pessimistic i don't think any of this pledge is going to come uh, to russia <laughs> uh let's start it uh, there and I already provided some example where even our like community environmental program was kind of shut down 
because they can't receive any foreign money. So that's uh, the starting point. And um, yeah, just grassroots work with small organizations. So I'm personally part of two philanthropic organizations and we only finance um, um, you know, small, small community around community owned. Uh, um, I, I don't know if you would formally say organizations, it's like a, you know, community led initiatives. <laughs> yeah. But that's a, a lot of work, you know, to make sure that it all, that you need to co-create. Like my main thing is all about co-creation. So otherwise, uh, you know, we're not gonna go any, in, in like far. <laughs> Thank you for the, the important question. Um, any? Do we have any other questions um, from the floor today? Okay. Oh, yes, we do. Um. Hi. Um. I don't. I can't. Yeah, it's very strange <laughs> listening and not listening. Um. Just wondering about any tips you might have. It might not be in your remit. Um, for how to get that funding to include payments to indigenous people and communities that are participating in research um, and whether academic funders look at that favorably. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have answers to that. It's a good principle. But if you do have any, that would be great to hear. Thanks. Yeah, so in, uh, in my experience in Alaska, I know one person who's involving indigenous people uh, in their research and as providing financial compensation is so uh, to collect data, things like that. Um, that's one that I've heard of in the entire state and there are three universities in that state, uh, in Alaska. Um, he was my advisor for my uh, PhD that I did very briefly. Uh, didn't finish with Drew because of ethical reasons, but um, yeah, I mean, just do it, period. Uh, for In terms of, um, advice on how to include ind indigenous people and get that funding to them. Um, work with policymakers, get lawyers involved, um, get other researchers in involved, get all the necessary parties involved and just talk, like get in a circle and talk and figure it out. I mean, there are ways, uh, it seems really daunting because you don't learn how to do that in a PhD or in a master's or you don't learn how to talk to people in academia. Uh, so I think that that is just a first practice that you can do in order to get the resources where they're going to be used best uh, and just get indigenous people that money because they need it. Uh, money is always a good thing, but um, a lot of it usually, um, yeah, I mean, the amount that indigenous people get out of the total funds that are allocated uh, is despairingly small. Uh, and it's in my, uh, yeah, from my perspective, it's pretty, um, pretty polarized and not uh, just at all. So yeah, Sue, yeah. Yeah, and this is just a specific technical. I mean, in the U.S., uh, a lot of big funders, the National Science Foundation, you definitely can and should put in funding. And so what we do is we give funding directly to the tribes and then decisions on who it goes to within the tribe is allocated and decided by the tribe. So some agencies in the U.S. you can and some agencies you can't, but it certainly is feasible. You just have to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we work with an organization called Future Footwear Foundation, and we've, we've been financing research uh, in collaboration with indigenous communities for like seven years. And uh, if you're interested, I can put you in touch and I can see already you're wearing Vivas. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think, um, and are there any uh, last remarks from any of our panelists? Or are we happy to, to wrap up? Okay, well, thank you again so much. Um, for your perspectives and your knowledge and your experience. It's been absolutely fascinating. And uh, thank you for joining us and for your questions. And our next session will be uh, at 2.30 and that is looking at infrastructure damage and coastal erosion. So it'll be another really interesting session. Um, thank you so much and thank you to our panelists. Thank you.